introducing to you one of the genuine legends of Australian Muay Thai, the man with the smile and the power to go. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for John Wayne. Over 400 years ago, the Kingdom of Siam was in the middle of a 200-year struggle with bordering Burma and Cambodia. The art of Muay Thai was developed out of these wars by the Siamese military. Unarmed techniques were developed when soldiers lost their weapons in warfare. The skills of today are almost identical to the battlefield techniques of yesterday. Unlike the restrictive styles of modern day boxing and martial arts, Muay Thai is a science of eight limbs. Hands, elbows, knees, feet are all used as weapons. In 1767, the ancient Siam capital of Ayutthaya fell. The invading Burmese troops rounded up thousands of Thais and took them as prisoners. Among them were a large number of Thai boxers. As legend has it, the Burmese king Mangra wanted to see how his boxing champion would compare to the best Thai fighter, a man named Nai Kanam Tom. The men fought, and Nai Kanam Tom won easily. The king asked him if he would battle an additional nine Burmese champions to prove his skill and courage. I Kanam Tom agreed and defeated them all. King Mangra was so impressed that he not only gave him his freedom, but declared every part of the Thai is blessed with venom. Wayne Pa started his fighting career at age 14. His first professional bouts were at age 17, which included winning an Australian title. From humble beginnings, Pa would go on to become a seven times world Muay Thai champion a true legend of the sport. A sport where participation is not for the faint-hearted. Punches and kicks are delivered with devastating effect. Elbows and knees capable of ending a contest in rapid time. It is a sport of tradition, forged from centuries of rigorous training and combat. A rare discipline where a lion-hearted loss can reap a fighter more respect than an easy victory. This is John Wayne Parr's world. When I was a young boy, I used to watch the Monkey Magic and stuff when I was three or four years old. And it, it always inspired me to get into the, to the martial arts, whether it be Taekwondo, Karate, Kung Fu, Ninjutsu, uh, anything to do with training and fighting. That was my, my whole dream. Back when I was a, a, a teenager, um, Van Damme was my ultimate hero. My room was just uh, full of Van Damme posters. Whatever I get my hands on, as uh, soon as the, a new movie would be released at the video shop, I'd be the first one at the door putting my name on the back of the poster so that when the video got old, that um, I was the first one to receive it. He was the ultimate hero. And then we moved to Brisbane at the age of uh, when I was 10. And then 11, we found a uh, Taekwondo school that wasn't too far away from our house. And yeah, just absolutely loved it. The whole idea of wearing a karate gi and, and the, as you're doing punches, the karate gi just snap with you when you do your kicks. Um, you really felt like you were the, the karate kid. So that was my whole ambition, was the, to be a world champion in Taekwondo and go to Korea and, and live over there and, and uh, adapt to their, their fighting style. After about a year and a half, two years, the Taekwondo school, they were sort of struggling financially. So they, they moved out of the little hall that we were in and it would just so happen that six months later, um, uh, kickboxing started in the very same hall. So a few of the boys from high school, they were keen to, to give it a try. And then 
the very first day, it was just blew my socks off how how more exciting it was than taekwondo because of the head punches and and there was um, knees and everything else. And uh, I thought, yeah, now my whole my whole life's goal is now to go to Thailand and become a, a Thai boxer. The closest thing I think to a street fight comes with Muay Thai. Why? Because if you fight under Muay Thai rules, not K1 rules as they call it, where you can clinch, use the knees, you're allowed to use the elbows. I mean, it doesn't get any more real than that. As people know, they it's not like in karate we used to hit, it would sort of stop, but with Muay Thai, boom, they cut it. So it slices you, you know, and it just opens the skin up. They also grapple, you know, they will do hours and hours where they'll clinch you up. And once you get in a Muay Thai clinch, if you don't know what you're doing, it's good night. But with the grappling, with the elbows, with the knees, which again have no protection on them, so it's, it's an incredibly hard object to get hit with, the leg kicks, you can actually throw somebody in Muay Thai. So the only thing missing is the fact that you can't go on with the grappling game once you hit the ground. So again, from a combative point of view, to have elbows, knees and everything, the footwork of a boxer, you know, and the grappling skills and everything, Muay Thai is second to none. Nineteen ninety-three, I met John Wayne Pa. By that time, he not a John Wayne Pa yet. He's a Wayne Pa. He just a, a little boy. Uh, look like a <laughs> he homeless boy. I walk in, come to the shop in the Rapid Plaza, and he asked me. I say, can I have a satay? And after that, the conversation is start. Is, uh, I want to learn Muay Thai. My very first meeting with Richardville was when I was uh, just a lad, just 16. Through a friend of a friend, they found out I was going to have my first fight against uh, a Thai, my very first Thai. Word got around, so this, this Thai man come and visited me. said, if you're going to fight a Thai, you're going to need some, some extra help. So I have a friend that can show you the, the, like the true um, Thai style so that you don't get too injured and you'll have a better chance. We started teaching with a, a man named Saki. He started showing me the, the basics of changing my guard a little bit, making me a bit standing more strong. And then he said, oh, I have a friend, Richard Vell. He has a Thai restaurant in um, the middle of Surface, Surface Paradise. If you go and see him, he'll sponsor you to go and eat um, dinner one, once a week. I oh, how was this? My very first sponsorship. And Richard was just this really awesome character that just loved the sport. and. He would, he'd, he'd shadow box in the middle of his restaurant and he'd show us what to do and what he expected of us. I just felt like I had a very strong bond. And then my, my house was only uh, a 15 minute walking distance. So I'd walk to the shop and it wasn't so much about going to have a meal anymore. It was just for Richard's company. I'd just sit in the back room in the kitchen and as he'd prepare the chicken skewers or, or slicing up anything, all the food, we'd just talk about Thailand, Muay Thai, Thai culture. My whole day would just be spent in the kitchen, just, just listening to the stories. Not so much talking, just listening. I had a, a really tough fight on, in Noosa. Second round, he doesn't do well. I lose my temper. I just go up on the ring and whack him on the head. I said, look, you want to be Muay Thai future, do this one. Do them properly. And I ended up coming back and winning by knockout in the fifth. And Richard was so impressed. He said, "I think I think you got what it takes to go all the way in the sport. So I'm prepared to, to send you to Thailand if you can organise your own passport. I'll do the rest." My sister-in-law and my brother went back to Thailand. So, and before I went back to Thailand, we said to Wayne, "You want to go to Thailand? Say, I like I like to go to Thailand to learn, to learn Muay Thai." And I said, "Look." When you make passport, this is your dream come true. This is the ticket. I bought the ticket from him and make a tattoo uh, like this in his shoulder uh, and say, when you become Muay Thai, but you make sure 100% you're going to be Thai boxer because his tattoo at the back, symbol of Muay Thai, will be stick on your back all of your life. When you go to Thailand, you going to learn Muay Thai. You're not going holiday. You're going to the hell. You're not going to stay in the hotel. 
you're not going to be eat that hamburger, uh, nice food, good food, whatsoever, anything. You going to stay the same in the camp, same like uh, any Thai people do it. Yeah, I got my passport, and then Richard kept his word and organized my ticket and organized for me to stay with his family in Patea. A quiet back street in Patea is the address of Sidyon Tong International Boxing Camp, John Wayne Pa's very first Thailand gym. And here we are at uh, Sidyon Tong Gym in Patea, Thailand. This is the, the very first gym that I came to as a 19 year old with uh, the hopes and dreams of one day of becoming a, a Muay Thai champion. I got asked to come here by my sponsor in Thailand as this was one of the most famous gyms in, in Thailand at the time and it was, it was such an honor to to come here as a kid and to see the Thai fighters training and going through the motions and just having a dream to be one day to, to be in their footsteps and, and to win a championship, a, a real championship, not just a, a national one, but to come to Thailand and, and fight the very best of the best. This this was the, the ring where I, I started all, all my uh, beginnings, my humble beginnings. Uh, I kicked the pads every afternoon for, for three to five rounds and just every, every day just exhausted. And I'd look across and I'd see the Thai boys and they'd be kicking their pads three times as hard and, and have the ten times the, the amount of work rate. And you know, how am I ever going to fight these guys? These guys are just machines. But um, just kept plodding along, uh, get, getting my basic skills up to scratch. I'd already had about 13 fights in Australia before I came here, so I sort of had a little bit of an idea. But just, just trying to deal with the heat, trying to deal with the heat and the con different conditions. Very, very different to back home. So this is where the the journey all started. Uh, I got dropped off by by Rich's brother, and he said, "Okay, this is where you're going to be living from now on." He introduced me to the family, and then, then they drove away. So as a 19-year-old, it was. Yeah, it was very scary. I was, this was the realisation that I was on my own. For the first three months, I shared a, a double bed with Rich's brother and then Tung. And he was, he was a heavy set man, so he'd take up three quarters of the bed and I'd have be pressed up against the wall with just a little bit of um, place to sleep. And every night, he used to snore like it, was a, like it was a freight train and everything would vibrate in the room and it was impossible to sleep. And to make matters worse, I'd always get a, a leg or an arm thrown on me either side. And, uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of memories from, from living here and, and gradually learning how to speak Thai. Because everyone spoke English, so there was no urgency to, to, to pick up the language. I trained at Sidi for three months and it, it was okay, but I didn't feel like I was growing as a fighter. I sort of felt like I was sort of staying stale. I had one fight for the camp, uh, which I won. Uh, by fourth round uh, knockout, but after that, I, I really wanted to push the, to be a star. So it just so happened, uh, Seng Ten Noi came to the Gold Coast to have a fight, and his manager and um, Seng Ten uh, met with Richard, and Richard took care of him, showing him hospitality, um, taking him to the parks, and giving him money, and buying him clothes and food, and really, really giving in his heart while they stayed here. Before they left, they said, "Oh, to, as an appreciation for everything that you've done for us." We'd like to return the favour by when we get back to Thailand, we'll go and pick up the um, that boy you keep talking about, and we'll take him to our camp, and um, he can train with us. So sure enough, I, they, I get a knock on the door the next morning when they arrived, and so come on, you're going to come to you're going to come to Bangkok now. So like, whoa. This used to be where we used to buy all our um, sweets and, and drinks from. So this is probably one of the, our favourite little pastimes was coming here and uh, getting 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 a coke or just a bit of sugar to put back in the system after sweating out three or four kilos after a session. Um, not only is the shop gone, the whole house seems to have disappeared. So this is uh, a, a little bit sad. <laughs> Hello.
พ่อก็นั่งแบบเนี้ยเขาก็นั่งลงกราบกราบพ่อนะพอกราบก็ขอร้องอ่ะพ่อไม่เอาหมวยพลังพ่อกลัวไม่เอาขอจอนเวียบอกเอาเหอะเดี๋ยวมันเกิดทำลายได้มันทำลายได้รวยขึ้นมาพี่โนจะได้มีสตังค์กับมันอยู่ถึงเช้าขออยู่เนี่ยขอจอนเวียนมาอยู่กับค่ายพ่อเนี่ยนะถึงเช้าพ่อก็ปฏิเสธตลอดเพราะนี้เอ็นแกเป็นตะคิวตะคิวที่ขาหัวหน้าหัวหน้าวิชิตเป็นตะคิวที่ขาหยิกเลยสงสารกันเลยอ่ะอ่ะอ่ะโอเคเอาเอาเอาคนแรกผมเป็นคนไทยใช่ไหมผมไม่ชอบเป็นมวยที่ว่าเป็นค่ายมวยที่ว่าอําพรางอ่ะปิดบังอําพรางเป็นมวยเดิมพันไงเราต้องปิดบังกลางซ้อมไม่ให้ใครดูไม่ให้ใครดูส่วนพ่อดุดุพ่อให้ใจจอนเวียนสู้จริงไหมจริงครับจอนเวียนถึงสู้เคยแพ้ไหมไม่เคยไม่เคยแพ้เดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมาเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเดี๋ยวมาเนี่ยมานั่งเนี่ยเ
eating, getting yelled at, having parties. There's so many memories in, in this whole complex. So good, good, good and bad, but I'm sure in any household is exactly the same with every, any family. So yeah, it's like it's like I grew up here. It's, it's awesome. Uh, yeah, pork, kitten mama, kabukari. เอ่อขอบคุณทุกอย่างอ๋อเอ่อมึงเฮ้ยรักรักรักรักรักคิดถึงเป็นคนช่วยเสื้อของ <laughs> Once upon a time, this is where all the training used to be done. Uh, we had the, the boxer room here where, where 10 of us used to sleep um, side by side on the wooden floor. I wish I could show you the, the bathroom because the bathroom is the old school where you, you splash on, you, then you lather up the soap, and you, you splash off again, and then you. It's a sit-down toilet with no toilet paper, so you have to put water in your hand to wipe your bum. You just splash the water in. The ring was in the centre, so it was nice and open, so the breeze could come through, but it would keep the sun off. And the, the name of the gym still up here. Um, I can't read Thai, but it pretty much says uh, Lumin Kwan. Uh, unfortunately, though, the the water that's been here from all the sewerage and the shower used to all sit underneath the ring with all the mosquitoes, and then over the years, the, the woods rotted. But you can see the remains of where the ring was, um, under the under the heat, when it used to get really crazy, it used to get 38, 40 degrees by 3, 4 in the afternoon, and then we'd have to do um, between 4 to 8 rounds, or 5, five minute rounds on the pads. Um, it was so hot and so hard and get so yelled at, but uh, but without without what we did here for all those years, I, would, I wouldn't have a gym back in Australia and I wouldn't have the, the, the belts on the, on the wall and I wouldn't have a house and I, I would have nothing. I'd, I'd have a nine to five job, if that. And so, yeah. so this is where it all started? This is, this is, this is my history. My history is here. In Thailand, the ring is considered your classroom. This is where you're learning all your skills. So, before a fight, you, you say thank you to the ring for helping you get fit and prepare for every battle. So, yeah, it's not just a, it's not just an apparatus. It's a, it's a part of a big part of Muay Thai. It's huge. Before fights, we'd buy flowers and um, we'd buy the cloths and we'd decorate the corner posts. We believe that the, the wood has ghosts inside them from when you chop down the trees, the, the, the ghost comes with the wood. So we, we ask the, the ghost for permission to give you inner strength as well. Sometimes the ghosts are women and they like to be dressed up. So you, you decorate them with pretty ribbons and sometimes perfume and, and you add the powder and monks come and bless the ring as well. And, uh, it's the same material that I made my mong kong out of. Um, I, one of the old ghost houses uh, I asked permission if I could take the old ribbon and replace it with a new one and out of the old stuff I, I, I made, uh, I plated it, I make the mong kong, so that's why it's uh, so special to me. The Lumpini Stadium in Bangkok was opened on December 8th, 1956. It is the Thai boxing equivalent to Madison Square Gardens, a mecca where every aspiring Thai boxer dreams of fighting. It is considered sacred ground where fights are held three times a week to packed audiences in excess of 10,000. By being invited to fight at Lumpini Stadium, Thai boxers know they have made a name for themselves in the Muay Thai world. As the one fight goes up, 
the second point is to come down and sit in this seat. And then in here is all the trainers cheering for the red corner, uh, giving them instructions. To the, they're not allowed out of this pen while they're cheering, just so they don't get in the way of the general public that are paying. And then the, the next fighter is in their position. They got their gown on. They got their monk on. They're trying to psych themselves up. They're watching the, the fights, the, the, the atmosphere of all the betting. And then as soon as the fight before them, as soon as they're finished, this guy's up. He gets ready to go up into the ring. As he's about to go up, the next fight takes the position on the chair. So there's no delay whatsoever in between the fights. It's just one after the other, bang, bang, bang. It's not like foreigner countries where you have the uh, that walkout music and the lights and the fireworks and all the razzmatazz. It's just, just pure business. It's all about making money. In the change room here, we have a sign. Um, Tam Port, Team Lakhmoy. I mean, uh, in the olden days, if there was so much pressure on the fighters to win that if they lost, the trainers used to give them a backhand, or it was what's known as round six, which no boxer would want because no matter how strong you are, you could never hit your trainers back because they're older and they have the more respect. So it's pretty much asking, please do not hit your fighters until you get back to your own camp. Thai style, Thai style. As the Thai boxers are just about to make their way up into the ring, uh, they have a little sand pit. So they'll kneel down, they'll ask permission from the, the gods, um, from Buddha, from, from anyone that's going to give them inner strength. They'll touch slightly onto the sand and brush it into their hair. Um, the Thais believe that when you're born, you're born from Mother Nature, and when you die, you go back into the earth. So no matter who you are or if you're a champion or anyone, you're never above Mother Nature. So that's just their way of reminding themselves that they're, they're still human before they go into battle. In the mornings, Wayne's about 8 o'clock uh, fight day. So in the Western country, we have the luxury of Wayne in the night before, whereas in Thailand, same day Wayne. Here, it's all fenced off and all the punters will lie up around here and they'll have one official that stands at the scales and then the boxer has to go into the cage um, naked. No towel, no undies, no, no nothing. And then they'll hop on the scales and then on the blackboards they'll have a guy with some chalk and he'll write down your official weight. And once you get the, the tick of approval and then you're allowed to go and rehydrate. But it's, it's pretty rough. You only get about two meals in breakfast and uh, lunch. It's sort of hard. If you lose about eight kilos, you're only putting about three back on. Or what you can do is go to the local hospital and you can get a, a bag of IV to help put the vitamins back into your system. So pretty much uh, back to normal come flight time. <laughs> I had two, three, three fights for Song Chai, which I which I won as well. So, um, so now Song Chai said, "Okay, um, I think it's time to uh, for your for the big time. Um, I'd like to promote you at like Lumpini." It's like, whoa! This is the ultimate dream. At this stage, no Australian had ever fought there before, so it was an absolute honour to to be the first that night. Uh, one of the Thai champions, Namkabun. He was defending his Lumpini title, and I was the the very next fight after him. So I'm sitting in the little pen that they have at Lumpini, and the crowd's just going ballistic for the main event, and just the roar of the crowd, and I'm in the waiting pen, just absolutely pulling my pants, thinking, holy crap. I'm waiting at the bottom of the stairs, and Namkabun's come off the stairs, and as he's come down, he's, he's slapped my glove, wish, uh, wishing me luck, good luck, good luck, man. I said, oh my god, I can't believe, not only um, there's, there's Namka Bourne, but here I am just about to climb the ropes. Got into the ring, and as I'm doing the Ramoy, just taking big breaths, thinking to myself, oh, this is this is it. I'm living living my dream. So I got in there, and the, the first two rounds wasn't going too well, because I'd lost a lot, lot of weight. Um, but then after getting a, a growling in the round two, uh, I started to pick up my game. And once I started to land a few shots, the, the Thai crowd started to, to cheer. Um, I think I was the big underdog, so it would have been um, big money for anyone that put money on me. So the crowd was cheering and cheering, and then the, the, the more that I landed, the deeper the cheer would get. And then I ended up landing um, some nice shots in the fourth, stopping, stopping him in the fourth. So yeah, it was uh, just the, the most amazing buzz you could ever imagine. This was my second fight at Lumpini. 
I only just turned 21 a week before, so I didn't really have a chance to have a party or cake or anything. And one of the big things at Lumpini is if you fight on TV you re and win by knockout, you receive a gold chain. So I wanted to give myself a gold chain for my birthday. From the opening round, I applied lots of pressure and having a slight weight advantage, I tried to make sure that I loaded up all my shots to hit as hard as possible, to make him feel everything. I'd worked with my trainer in the hotel room before we left, that every time he threw a kick, we were going to catch, throw a leg kick, and then add one to the head. Just like that. From here I could see Jay Louis was a little bit rattled, so I wanted to jump on him as quick as I could. He was very resilient though, so I took a lot of shots. As I was halfway through the combo, I heard someone yell out, throw an uppercut. So I started looking for the gaps, and the last one made me flush. I knew Joe Louie had no chance of recovering in such a short time, so I ran across the ring, and while the uppercuts were still working, I wanted to throw as many as I could to finish the fight. Yes, and I finally won my birthday wish. Once I moved to Bangkok and started training with Sengten in, in uh, Pomenaut, Sengten was a regular and a couple of other boys at the camp were fighting on Song Chai shows. So I'd go watch Sengten fight at Lumpini and it was, it was always the, the greatest shows you could ever see, the best versus the best. And then every Saturday night was um, Song Chai's promotion show on Channel 5. So I learned very fast that, that he was the man to, to fight for. Song Chai, who was Thailand's number one promoter, he, he said, oh, I really in, enjoyed your fight. You showed a, a lot of promise. We want to make you one of the, one of the boys in our, our promotions. So he was number one. From going from small time little, little village fights to, to all of a sudden fighting on TV and fighting in front of crowds of 40, 50, 60,000 people was, uh, yeah, just a dream come true. เจอจอนเวนครั้งแรกที่เขามาฝึกมวยไทยแล้วเป็นเป็นเด็กที่แปลกก็ติดตามยอดมวยไทยของเราตอนนั้นแสงเทียนน้อยพอเริ่มประเดิมจัดครั้งแรกนี่เขาชกได้ดีแหละเป็นนักมวยฝรั่งคนเดียวที่ใช้ศิลปะมวยไทยเตะเข่านะแล้วก็เตะสอบเข่าเป็นนักมวยฝรั่งที่ท้ามวยไทยฟันสอบแล้วจะเป็นนักมวยฝรั่งที่ใช้ทัดมาลาคือปักสอบเข้าไปจอนเวียนตามได้ลูกนี้คนไทยทําได้ก็คือฟันสอบแต่จอนเวียนนี่หัดปักสอบโอ้จอนเวียนนี่ต่อยต่อยกับโอโรโนกระดูเดือดมั้งลูกเขาต่อยกับยอดมวยไทยนะจอนเวียนนี่ไม่ได้ต่อยกับมวยโดยทั่วไปนะเขาต่อยกับมวยระดับเงินแสนแสนทั้งนั้นผมผมจำได้จำได้เอ่อมิสเตอร์ซงชัยช่วยผมชกชกข้างล่างชกชกชนะชกชนะอันนี้นะเจอโอรอนอครั้งแรกอืมซงชัยมาเอ่อที่ที่ห้องก่อนชกวันนี้วันนี้สมมติชนะได้ลูกเที่ยวหน้าให้ชกเอ่อจิงแชมป์ลุงพีนีอืมแต่วันนั้นทำเพลงไม่เป็นไรโดนแดดโดนสอบโดนสอบแตก The 6th of July 1997, Cha Chang Sao, Thailand. A just turned 21-year-old John Wayne Pa, with only 21 fights to his name, takes on the veteran of some 250 battles, the legendary Arano. This is Pa's first fight against the Thai superstar. Round two, Pa takes a painful elbow, which opens a nasty cut. But with the courage of a true warrior, fights on. After a tight clinch, Pa's facial cut opens up, and the doctor is forced to call a halt to the match. 
ป็นมวยหนึ่งในจำนวนเป็นมวยยอดมวยอะ่ะคุณชกกับยอดมวยทั้งนั้นนะมันไม่ใช่ฝรั่งมาชกกับมวยที่ใหม่ๆนะเออทั้งนั้นชกเจอออร์โนเจตสุดอืมแล้วใครอีกชกเอสวันชกเอสวันสนุกคิดว่าไม่ไม่เคยคิดจะจะชนะครับแต่แต่โชคดีไม่โชคดีเราเก่งโอเคช่องสตาร์บอสกี้นี่ก็ถือว่าเป็นมวยยอดมวยฝรั่งคนแต่คุณดีกว่าเพราะนี่เขากระหนักระดับเดียวกับลามอนเดเกอร์ My fight with Skabowski was very important because once upon a time I was the best foreigner in Thailand but now that I left Skabowski he was the new hero and he was the man that everyone was cheering This was only a three round fight So it was pretty much like a sprint, from bell to bell. It was non-stop action. Skabowski had a habit of being a little bit lazy with his jab. Every time he throw it, he wouldn't bring it back to his guard, and I would try and come over the top with my right hand to land flush in his face. This was the winning shot coming off the ropes. As I came back off, I landed the right hand flush on the bridge of his nose. Breaking the bone, creating a cut, and also loosening some teeth. King's birthday, the year 2000. I was supposed to fight another pretty famous Thai who was um, a right-hander, uh, orthodox stance. And then at the weigh-in, my my opponent hopped on the scale, and he was say 69. Then I hopped on the scales, and I was 72. And Song Chai wasn't happy. Ah, oh, I can't put this fight on. There's too much weight difference. Uh, Masato was supposed to fight Orono, but now Masato is fighting someone else, so Orono is free. Why don't you rematch Orono tomorrow? And then my whole stomach fell through, and then I rang Sang Ten, and I said, Sang Ten, there's a change of plan. They want me to fight Orono. He's a southpaw. I haven't been paid for a southpaw. And Sang Ten was confident, and he started laughing. He said, nah, we'll take this fight. I, I, reckon, I reckon there's a good chance we can win this. Um, I've even got a game plan. Uh, I'll tell you tomorrow. I couldn't sleep. I'm nervous. I kept having all these evil dreams about how Orono was going to um, touch me up again. So in the morning, I've woken up and I ran downstairs. Okay, Singtin, please uh, help me. What's what's this game plan? I said, Ah, oh, easy. Tonight, I want you to fight Southpaw. Southpaw versus Southpaw. I said, Mate, I've never trained Southpaw before. He's a world champion at Southpaw and he's going to smash me. I said, No, no, I'll explain to you. If you stand orthodox and he's southpaw, it's easy for his elbows to land flush in your face. Where if, if you stand southpaw as well, that lead hand is going to protect you every time he left, let, lets that left elbow go. So it made sense. I did some shadow boxing in, in the gym and it seemed to work okay, but it wasn't enough to make me feel confident. Uh, I'm sitting up on stage waiting to walk out to the ring the whole time just thinking, I'm dead. I am, I'm going to get knocked out and smashed and killed. And I thought, I'll, I'll give this a go. If it doesn't work, I'll just change back. And then first round, it worked. The 5th of December 2000, the King's birthday. A fight for the IMF world title. Par is confident, fit, and comes at Orono hard. This was the making of the gunslinger. John Wayne Parr had arrived in the world of international Muay Thai. In Parr's corner that night was the legendary Sung Tung Noi, who told Pa that he had spent four years in Thailand, which was the equivalent to studying for a university degree. All you need for your diploma is the world title. And after five rounds, um, yeah, I ran around the ring. Um, I've gone to thank Orono. He sort of shrugged me off and pushed me to the side. He didn't want any of them doing me after, after our fight. And then, um, yeah, I took his world title off him, and and it was live on Thai TV. So to this day, it's probably one of the biggest highlights of my life. And then to beat him in front of a hundred thousand Thai TV world title uh, as a as a, uh, a Westerner in Thailand, I couldn't ask for a better scenario. It was the ultimate. I think the Thai people appreciate a Westerner coming to their country and fighting their sport and, and fighting hard. I don't think it matters if you, if you win or lose. They're more worried about if you're going to stand there toe-to-toe -to -toe and get cut and get hurt, but 
keep coming forward and, and keep trying your hardest, that's worth more than, than, than winning. So many foreigners, when I was there, I'd watch fight and they'd get the tiniest nick and they'd pretty much give up on their stools. You just see them saying, mate, you're right. You, and they'd just shake their heads. They wouldn't want to go back out. Whereas I'd watch the ties and the ties would have half their head missing. And um, all I could do was they couldn't get out there fast enough to try and redeem themselves. The hardness of Thai fighters was never more evident than when Wayne Parr clashed with Pengrit at the King's Cup tournament on December 5th, 1999. Parr was in devastating form and puts on a fight clinic. With surgical precision, Parr lands punch and kick combinations that would have ended a lesser adversary. With nationalistic pride and a courageous resolve, Pengrip battles through five brutal rounds. He hangs tough while suffering a broken arm and nose, ultimately going down on an obvious points decision. Pangrit demonstrated the spirit of a true warrior and endeared himself to an enormous crowd of some 150,000. Showing respect and humility in victory, Pa becomes the King's Cup champion. I know JWP since he was basically a junior. I saw him fighting, uh, um, since I was in Australia myself for many years, I saw him fighting in the early days when he was 17, and then he obviously moved to Thailand for many years, he trained in Thailand, and he became a very big name in Thailand, especially with his famous white crew, we call him the Gunslinger. He was the first one which actually went into the stadium and performed as, as, uh, a little bit of a special white crew, having his little gun on the side. So he became very famous, and he was one of the first foreigners fighting at Lumpini Stadium and making a big name on himself, the first foreigner winning the King's Cup twice. So he was very famous in Thailand, actually more famous in Thailand than he was in Australia at that time. Wayne Parr is a true ambassador for the sport of Muay Thai. His multiple world titles and his ability to speak fluent Thai make him a very popular candidate for international media organizations. On a recent trip to Thailand, Pa was grabbed by Siam Sport Television, one of the leading sports broadcasters in Bangkok. คนที่เหมือนบุคคลอย่างจอนเนี่ยเค้ายังเรียนรู้ประสบการณ์ในเมืองไทยเค้ายังเรียนรู้วัฒนธรรมของคนไทยเค้ารู้จักที่จะเร
I met Wayne nine years ago in Las Vegas in a training camp. We met on a Sunday and by Friday we were going out on our first date at the Bellagio Casino. <laughs> When I met Wayne, I had already accomplished quite a bit. I was um, eight-time United States champion. I, I won a world championship in 2001. I was recognized all over the country, and I was already at my peak and already in a comfortable position as a fighter, and, and I was happy. Wayne and Angie Parr own and operate Boon Chu Gym on Queensland's Gold Coast. From the casual visitor keen to experience grassroots Muay Thai to world title holders, Boon Chu is well equipped to provide the necessary training and hard conditioning fighters need to achieve their goals. Both Pars are hands-on. The gunslinger himself instructs beginners classes where eager students learn from the very best. <laughs> objective owning a gym was uh, just to have somewhere to train and, and teach classes to help pay for the rent and then as time went on uh, it, it was like molding clay the guys would come in with no idea and we slowly put them up and all of a sudden they're holding their own aspiring and you get them a fight here and there and, and now I've got half a dozen champions and um, a couple of world title holders uh, it's just just sort of uh, snowballed on from there it's been uh, very happy to what what the boys have accomplished and, and uh, you feel like a father looking after your kids, yeah. seeing them do well. Pa's sparring partner is junior welterweight Mark Saracino, WMC and WKA Australian title holder. Saracino will be fighting for the WKA South Pacific title in three weeks. A fight he will go on to win. Enter the aggressive Flip Street, holder of the WMC Asia Pacific title. Street is ramping up preparations for his WKBF world title match on December 11th with full tie rules against the very accomplished Yodfet. Uh, yeah, first barn session back after about four or five weeks off. Uh, felt very, very lethargic, very slow. Balance is all gone. Uh, last round, I grabbed uh, Flip's leg and put him down. As I, I was going down, he pulled me down with him. I uh, fell on top of his knee. So I just got a little, a little scratch there. Oh, it's okay. It doesn't need any stitches. It's only a little nick. So, a little, little paper cut. It's all right. And the problem is, uh, once it, once you have the scarring, it, it won't, it won't open on the same scar line. It, but along the, the side of the scar, the skin gets weaker. So uh, along this eye. I've got about five or six lines that keeps breaking right beside each other. Um, so this eye is starting to become a little bit of a problem. I've had probably uh, 50 odd stitches in this eye alone. Uh, well, I've had uh, 260 stitches from fighting, but um, this eye just by itself is 50. Fine tuning his preparations to defend his PABA and WBF super middleweight titles is Les Sherrington. Pa's boxing skills are sublime, and just what Sherrington needs to prepare. gym we train all different um, levels of people we train families we train children we train people that want to get fit and then we also have fighters a lot of people want to have that thrill of um, getting into the ring for the first time and have a go so we made it a little bit safer option where they wear shin pads 16 ounce gloves and he optional headgear the tournaments have been a real success um, we've had um, tournaments for eight years and we have champions 
we have fighters that had their first fight and they became champions and it's just great to see and be able to watch with our own eyes the growth of Muay Thai in Australia. A few times a year, Wayne and Angie Parr host tournaments held on Queensland's Gold Coast. It's an opportunity for amateur fighters to test their skills and most importantly to gain the priceless experience of competition. Yeah, feeling good. Ready to go, fight day. Round quick like usual. Yeah. No, I'm good. Training in the Boo Choo Gym. Fighting the Giants for the World Title on the Mayor Day Ball of the Football. Main event on tonight's card is the world title fight between Flip Street and Yod Fed. Both are hard-wearing, determined, and will not take a backward step. With no love lost, the crowd want action, and these warriors do not disappoint. After a spirited opening exchange, a sickening head clash put Street on the back foot. A large gash opening over his left eye. The corner have to pull out all stops to stem the bleeding so Street can come out for the next round. The elbow's flying, sick and fast. It is a close fought match, but Street has the benefit of Wayne Parr in his corner. His experience is enough to guide Street through this bloody Muay Thai war. As the battle wages, Street's cut reopens. Yodfed lands a ripping elbow, resulting in a nasty wound on Street's face. Street doesn't want the fight to be stopped. And because the blood flow isn't affecting his vision, the doctor allows the match to continue. It is a bruising five rounds of Muay Thai with both fighters showing enormous courage throughout the ebb and flow of their intense battle. This was as close as Muay Thai competition can get. The result went Street's way with only one point in it. The Thai come back hard, but Flip accumulated the points earlier on, so good point, good point. With, with the cuts like that, he just goes to prove what a warrior he is, because um, a lot of people wouldn't give up, but he kept going, so that's awesome. Street becomes a WKBF world champion and proudly displays the battle wounds. ผมไปครับครั้งแรกที่ออสเตรเลียครับเจอกับจอห์นเวนนี่นะครับผมก็ได้นับเขาแล้วก็ต่อยไม้เรื่อยผมก็ให้ชนะครับแล้วก็ผลความก็ชนะครับก็ได้
จะเว้นวาสนาเขาไม่ถึงครับ He kicked me in the head, put me down for an eight count, where where the rest of the fight um, was just on pure survival. I, I can't remember anything after the knockdown, but I ended up managing to get to the to the end of the fifth round and, and losing on points. Mid 2006, there was word around the the streets that they were going to do a a Muay Thai contender. Uh, the boxing contender had been a, a very large show around the world. Um, The same as every other format, 16 guys live in a house. But now they're going to do the Muay Thai version. I get a phone call saying, oh, "Hello, this is such and such producer from the, uh, the United States. Would you be interested in being a competitor in uh, the Contender Asia?" I said, "Oh, yeah, I'll give you my an answer right now. It's definitely a yes." 16 of the best Muay Thai fighters from around the world came to Singapore for the chance to win 150,000 US dollars. Each week, two will face off. The winner stays, and the loser goes home. They'd shoot one episode every three days. So Monday, Monday was challenge. Tuesday was um, training, and then Wednesday would be fight night, and then uh, same on the other side. So Thursday challenge, and then Saturday would be fight night, and then it would have Sunday off. So there, no no newspaper, no TV, no radio. We just have to re rely on each other as feedback to um. To, to talk and talk about fights so that that have um, material to use for the show. So yeah, I ended up uh, my first fight ended up being against the the French bloke. It was the first time in my life that I'd ever been so angry, and ever wanted to knock someone out as as bad as I did that that night. If I had uh, kept my cool, I think I could have um, dominated and, and stopped him. But because I was so angry, the harder I tried to knock him out, the the less chance that it was coming. So I ended up having a, a five-round war, and luckily for me, I beat him. My my second fight was against uh, a gentleman called Zidoff um, from Switzerland. Poor Zidoff, he he's a really nice guy, funny, good jokes, good stories, but he's li very limited Muay Thai skills. He he tries, big heart, but yeah, just just not quite there. Very lucky that he got on the show. By just how it worked, uh, I, I was to fight him second, and then uh, I stopped him in the third round. My last fight was in the semi-finals against um, Jabbar Askarov uh, from Russia. Very tough a competitor again. Um, it was uh, me and him, or who was going to fight Yuan Singlai in the final. Once again, five-round war. I got an opportunity to go to uh, go to the final with uh, with Yuan Singlai. So, if I can get him again, I'll be in the final. The final with Yuan Singlai was one of the biggest fights of my career. He's the toughest fighter in the world, pound for pound. So I really had to make sure that I, I bought my A game. I wanted to prove to him that I wasn't afraid and walk forward and constantly give him pressure. If I give him room to breathe, then that means he'd have his way with me. So I wanted to show that not only I wasn't afraid, but I was going to have a crack. That knee land flush and it winded me. And then, as I was winded, I slowly brought my left hand back, and he came over the top with his own punch and put me down for the eight count. Even here, I'm still struggling to breathe. So I'm lucky the fight didn't get stopped in the first round. Solid knockdown from Yodson Fly. A lot with his boxing skills. He sees that as an opening. Your Sang Lai is probably the hardest hitter that I've ever fought. You could just feel everything, every punch, every kick, every elbow. Even there, that one landed flush, cutting me again. And he's always cheeky. Just when you do something good, he just gives you a little smirk to say, nah, that's nothing. Oh, certainly not. As they trade again, a lot of leather being thrown. This is unbelievable. Right here, Yod Singlai takes a little step to the side and nails me with that straight left bang. It was the same sensation as if you were to be hit in the head with a sledgehammer. I've never been hit so hard in my whole uh, career at that point. 
I knew this was the last fight that my dad was ever going to see, so all I kept thinking every time I got knocked down was just get up, you got to finish this fight. Doesn't matter if you win or lose, just make sure you finish it. I'm one of these people, if I get knocked down, I get back up and I run at you, and I'm just to prove that you didn't hurt me. I'm, I'm a pressure fighter. My, my technique is not the greatest, but what I lack in technique, I make up with in, in being in your face and constantly throwing technique at you. You guys seem glad just showing how technical is once again. One little mistake and you're on the canvas picking yourself up. Very lucky not to get kicked in the head with that one. Don't try that at home, kids. Tactics here of Wayne Parr in the final round. He's going for the grapple. He's closing the distance on Yodson Clyde. He's not allowing the thing not to work that real. If I still stood at range, Yodson Clyde would have kicked me to death. So the best thing is to do is just, just get in that pocket and just keep attacking. Don't stop. No matter what happens, don't stop. Here we are, almost 30 seconds on the clock. I knew I was down on points after two knockdowns. It was either balls of the wall or lose. So I just had to go for it. From here, Yodson Glade just, just took this round, I think. The last last 30 seconds, he came back and just landed a few heavy shots on me that I couldn't do nothing about. It was sort of like the icing on the cake after dropping me twice. I was happy with my performance that I got up and finished the fight, but Yosin Glow is just, just not on another level. At this point, I didn't care that I lost the fight. I didn't care that I wasn't the contender champion. I was just devastated that I didn't win for my dad because it was the last time that he'd ever get to see me fight. That hurt more than, than losing the fight. From all other fight sports, the respect and the martial arts tradition. Sure respect as a winner, Ensuring grace and defeat as much as a victory is a very important part of Muay Thai. It's actually the foundation of our sport. End of October 2007 was the filming of the, the last um, episode and then there was a six month gap before the, the final. So I went back to Australia. My poor dad got uh, diagnosed with um, pancreatic cancer. So that hit me for six. Um, my wife got pregnant. We were going to have a little boy. So, so now I'm, I'm here on, on this massive high from just about to have a little boy to um, my dad uh, just getting more skinnier and skinnier and weaker and weaker. From the Gold Coast, I had to drive to Brisbane to go to the airport and so I left my, my car at Dad's and Dad's mustered enough strength to come outside to, to wish me good luck and it just tore me apart seeing my dad in the condition that he was. And then it was a, there was the first time on the way to Singapore that I had time by myself where I didn't have to think about family or the gym or responsibilities. All of my last memories was dad's waving goodbye to me. And all I wanted to do more than anything in the world was to just to, to win. I didn't care that it was the prize money. I didn't care about the show. I think every, every man wants their father proud of him no matter what circumstances. Coming second on the contender wasn't a bad payday. I still got still got okay money. It was enough for me to have a little bit of a break and spend time with Dad. Uh, at this stage, I, Dad got to the stage where he, he couldn't he could no longer um, live on the outside. He had to go to hospital. He, he, he I'd sent him in for a checkup and we never left. I'd go I'd go for the next three weeks from ten in the morning till till nine at night, spending every, being his carer. During that time, the contender aired, the final aired, and I got to show Dad my fight with Yodsen Guy. And we watched the fight, and I got dropped and dropped again, and I fought hard through it, round three, round four, round five, I did my hardest. And at the end of it, Dad leant down off the bed, just just gave me that one of those father to son pats on the shoulder. He said, no, you did well, mate. You fought hard, I'm proud of you, mate. And that was that was worth more to me than anything the contender, contender could have offered, so, um, yeah, it's really, it really sucks.
One of Pa's most formidable opponents was the superstar Greek kickboxing champion, Iron Mike Zambides, arguably one of the toughest pound-for-pound -pound fighters in the world. Their first battle was in 2002, where Zambides won on a points decision, which was seen by some as a controversial one. The highly anticipated rematch came seven years later, and what a momentous showdown it was. Fight fans wanted a war, and these two warriors didn't let them down. This was a very important fight for myself because for seven years I had to live with the burden of, of having the loss to Zambides. Zambides was angry that I wasn't walking forward and, and making him come to me, so he started yelling at me, giving me abuse, telling me to come on, come forward, come into my range, but I wasn't going to play any part of it. I was going to make him come to me, and every time I did, I was going to make him pay for it too. I had a slight height advantage, so I was trying to keep everything long, long punches, long kicks, stepping with knees and getting out of there again before he could unleash his bombs. Here I cut him uh, perfect across the eye. I watched the skin split in front of my eyes and, and it was massive. So I'm surprised they even let the fight continue, but I'm glad they did. Their corner wasn't the, very professional. They didn't have Vaseline or adrenaline prepared. Let's take a little charge after that cut and try and widen it. Probing with the jab, Wayne Park throws the right hand up the tube. High left round kick from the Aussie. From here, just in the zone, you can't afford to make one mistake. It's constant focus. Because I've got him trailing. Two rounds to part. Well, certainly we want to see uh, JW launch that right hand. He's going to try and open up that cut. I'll tell you what, he's, uh, he's tough and he's loving and he's going to try and go bombing now because he knows he is on I the... found my left kick was just landing time and time again, so that was my main weapon. Every time he come in, halfway through a punch, I'd let my left leg go to land flush on his ribs to pull up his punches. Bang, and again, and again. Just staying long, in and out, in and out. Don't get into his range. At this stage, I was feeling confident that the fight was going my way. So, just had to keep focusing on what I was doing. Listen to all my instructions in the corner. Just make sure there's no mistakes. What are they doing? What needs to be done to a cut? Well, they've got a, they've got a mixture of adrenaline and uh, that's in there. They'll be trying to get it into the cut to, uh, to clot the blood, stem the bleeding wounds uh, in between the, uh, the fights. More left legs. My uncle had no answer for them, so I could throw them all night and pretty much land at will. Dave Hedgecock telling Zambides, kick the punches up. That is a horrid cut over the eye of Zambides as he clips Wayne with a left hook, goes well, to the body again. And here I felt that like I rocked him, so I wanted to jump on him and hopefully finish the fight before the end of the distance. But once again, I, I couldn't afford to get too punch happy, otherwise I could have walked on a more damaging shot, so in and out, constantly moving. Oh, I got through. Didn't get through. Had to put it through. Oh, got it through. The head would have rocked back. <laughs> it was on the body. Overhand right got through for Zambides though. And Parr sticks the jab. Sticks the jab. The There's the right hand. Nicely the right done. Right hand. Wayne Parr catches him again with that right hand to the cut area. Right here I get a little bit complacent and get hit with that overhand right. And which buckled my legs just a fraction. I moved around a little bit just to recover. Make sure that the head was clear. And then, and then back into it. I wanted to show also that I wasn't afraid to stand there and box with him as well. He might have had heavy hands, but I believe my hands were pretty sharp at that stage as well. So, And this is just, just showing off a little bit. I thought I had the fight in the bag, so I wanted to show that not only did I win the fight, but I, I could also embarrass him a little bit as well. This was probably one of the happiest moments in my career. After the, the seven years of waiting, I finally got my revenge in front of almost 5,000 people, all, all up on their feet with a standing ovation. It was just the perfect scenario. I couldn't help but uh, 
keep the tears from from flowing down the cheeks because uh, it was, I was so such a proud moment. Richard Ville was was so happy also. To, to after um, all the years that he looked after me, we'd, we'd finally done it. We'd become one of the best fighters in Australia. Without his help, I'd never be where I'm today. So he's like my dad. And I'm, I'm so happy that he's been supporting me for so many years. Two thousand and ten, um, Joe Nader offered me a, a, a fight down in Melbourne against um, Lam Songan, who was a multiple world champion, who I'd been following his career as one of these people that I thought that one day our uh, paths would cross for sure. He'd just come off a couple of um, big victories around the world, so he was a very, very tough competitor. His main weapons were his, his knees and his elbows, so we prepared a lot for that in the gym prior to the fight. We only been nothing more than ไม่ต้องใจผมคนนึงเลยนะที่ว่ารุ่นเดียวกันนะมีผมมีจอมเวลแล้วก็ยัดสังเกตเนี่ยเพิ่งขึ้นมาทีหลังที่ว่าที่
Why don't you go to Thailand? This is such an important fight. Yod Singlai, he's the top of the top. So no shortcuts. Go to Thailand. I said, are you sure? What about the family and what about the gym and what about business? He goes, I don't care. I'll take care of it all. You go over there. You you come back and you win. I'd met um, Sanchai, who was pound for pound the greatest Muay Thai fighter um, in this modern era. And he said, if you ever come to Thailand, um, please look me up and come and train with me. ดังมากๆครับแต่ก่อนแต่ไม่ค่อยไม่เคยได้คุยกันอะไรครับผมรู้ๆเข้าๆว่าเค้าเคยซ้อมอยู่ที่แสงเทียนนี่ครับแสง
but when they did declare him the winner, it was such an honest appreciation. Like some fighters get to the stage, especially after as many fights as John Wayne's had, where you kind of, maybe you do it for the pay ticket, you know, or you do it for another little credit. But he was truly elated. You know, I, I love the fact that that fight and that win absolutely, it meant the world to him. For your winner and the new WKA middleweight champion of the world from Australia, John Wayne In the ring, I, I started running around um, just uncontrollably, just from the excitement. I've just been beating the, the, one of the greatest middleweight fighters in the world. And now I've, I've beaten him, so it was a lifelong accomplishment to, to, to be the best of the best. And not only was it um, for a world title, but it was a genuine tie that's um, regarded as the hardest kicker in the world. So. The rematch, uh, John Van Pabio, John Sinclair, first of all, shows that JWP still can do toe to toe with the best. There is a Lord St. Clair in 72.5 kilo is definitely one of the best in the world, if not the best. So for JWP to revenge him from the contender final and win is a very important victory for him and a very important confidence victory at this part of his career where many people go down, he actually stepped up one more time and beat the absolute superstar. And I think that has done wonders for him and maybe has given him another year of life in the ring because if he would have lost against Jotzen Klein for the third time, that would have been very frustrating as a fighter. If you lose three times against um, the same guy in your division, that means people know that you're not the number one, mm -hmm. but he now proved that he is the number one or still can be the number one. So I think the, the fight Jotzen Klein versus John Wayne Power is a very important uh, psychological mm -hmm. victory for him. Uh, in order to keep him going for another 12 months. Yeah, in the future, yeah, I think three times. Well, yeah, so I'm kind of, um, <laughs> it, it, we're sick of them beating each other up. <laughs> I hope so, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I'm really young, chug up for me. There's no fight that I can ever have from this moment forward that's ever going to top of beating Jotzen Guy that night. There's nothing that's ever going to come close to it. So now we're at the stage where where Wayne Parr, you know, like a lot of fighters, he's 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 done it now. You know, it's like fighters get to a stage where well, I've done it all. What else do I need to do? You know, I've got nothing left to prove. So then you've got to ask yourself, well, well, what what are my avenues? I can become a fitness trainer. I can run a gym and everything. So the future for him looks very bright because he's very famous through Contender Asia. He was probably the most liked character in the whole show. Um, so in the future he's probably going to give many seminars, he could be a motivational speaker and I'm sure he's going to have a very successful gym uh, on the Gold Coast. The avenue that's open now to people like John Wayne is the movie industry. That's a tough industry. The difference with John Wayne is he has the skills, he has the fan base and everything else, he's got a built-in audience and he's real. And, and that's a huge element, you know, when you can get somebody up there on screen that is doing movies, even though they're playing, you know, a, a character and it's just written the script and everything, to be able to actually look at that person and know he's for real, that he's actually been, you know, a world champion, the likes of John Wayne Parr, that means a lot, I think, from the credibility factor. So I, I think he's got an incredible opportunity here, you know, to, to have a screen uh, career. The discipline he has will take him a long way, you know, in a movie career, because as I said before, Training for movies, is, it's almost like training for a fight. There's a huge expectation, you know, of 14, 16 hour days, week after week, in order to sort of get through a movie. So there's, there's some rigors involved there. And I think with his discipline, his knowledge of the fight game and everything else, I, I think he's going to fit in really well. After my career as being a professional fighter, I, I definitely wanted to stay in the, in the limelight. If I could stay in the media somehow, uh, I'd, I'd really like to get into the to the movie industry. I think I have what it takes. I, it's just like anyone in a new profession, I'd have to learn some skills um, from an acting point of view. But definitely, I'd like to take it to the next level, and hopefully, that can be my career after I hang up the gloves.
Nice job. Everybody good? All right, let's do one more. Set. Absolutely. And I'll tell you what, you saw in the promo that was put together by Fivo Christodoulou. Oh, John Wayne caught him! Oh. Wayne Parr has dropped Mike Zambides in the first round. Mike Zambides down on one knee, a standing eighth count from Dave Hedgecock. What a turnaround. I wasn't expecting that one. And look, Mike Zambides oh, look, Mike Wayne is Parr going in. in. He's Mike got Zambides got is hurt. He's, well, he's, he's done. Gone. He's dead! Sam Beatty is out! That's a second eight count to Wayne Parr in round one. Wayne Parr with knockout punches in the very first round. Richard, no one would have expected this I so early. I would not in a million years. And Michael Sam is out! Oh, a front kick to the head. Oh, then the left hand from Sam Beatty. Big right hand. Sam Beatty's still trying to shake that off, though. It's that's a hard he's call. Rattled, he's now he's, he's rattled. He's hurt. He's hurt. John Wade going for the kill. Railing punches down at Zambi. Zambi's covering up, trying desperately to last this Referee Dave point. Hitchcock keeping an eye on him. He doesn't want to step into something, but Mike Zambi is, is not fighting back. Ah, he's fighting back. What are you looking at, John? He's fighting back. He's in trouble. He's fighting back. He's in a lot of trouble, he's though. Make, he's in a Look at zone. Wayne Parr just he's railing to get punches. He's ready to get stopped. Whoa! 